a continuation of Andy Bernoff's work. So tonight there'll be an estimathon here, uh, and again it's going to be like on Tuesday. There'll be pizza at 5:30 in the uh, uh, in the dining tent, followed by the estimathon here around 6:15 or so. So please come to that. Um, and I want, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Eli Lubrov, who's uh, the CEO and founder of the Desmos Corporation, and uh, we're really honored to have him here. And I'll let you take it away. Amazing. Uh, thank you. Um, first off, are folks able to hear me okay? Front and back? Oh boy, awesome. Um, shout out to the sound crew. There might be a few other times that I put you to the test. Um, so we've got an hour together and I want to warn you in advance that I've packed maybe three hours of material into this hour. Uh, so buckle up, get excited. Um, and I'd love to start, if you could, see if you can find someone with a computer. And let's try to get like two people at each computer just for internet reasons. Um, and go to student.desmos.com and type in this code. And we're going to be going back and forth to this activity some. It's also going to be open for the next two weeks for the second two hours of material that we're not able to cover uh, so that you can go back and look at it. Um, but the opening question, have folks um, gotten this code down? Oh no, is it internet or is it Desmos? Phew, okay. <laughs> that I'm fine with. Um, all right, well we are going to try to do this internet free then. Um, but as you get ready, just memorize this or write it down on a piece of paper. Try to get in when you can, maybe form larger groups. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, all right, F, E, U, J, Eight S. Forgive my. Yeah, you don't need to use an account. Feel free to join anonymously. Um, and yeah, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to come back to this. You don't need to be at a computer. This is just a way for me to get some information back from you. It looks like, oh yeah, we've got 44 people successfully in. And the opening screen was just a little bit. I wanted to know about you. So how you're doing today? how well you know Desmos so that I can know how much to tailor the content about Desmos and how much you like Desmos so I can know if I've got a friendly crowd. <laughs> I'm also hoping to see some correlations between familiarity and uh, enjoyment of it. And sure enough, look at that. Looks like the more you know it, the more you like it, which means we've got um, either some people who are saying what they think I want to hear uh, or a good product. Um, but we're not actually going to be focused on Desmos uh, for a big chunk of this. I wanted to start by focusing on a different technology company, a little one that some folks might have heard of, uh, called Google. And we're going to start with a thing that I noticed when we were trying to build the percent feature in the calculator. Um, and noticed that if you type in 30 plus 20 percent into Google, into the calculator, the result it gives you is 36. <laughs> so to start, I'm curious if you agree with this result. So just a show of hands, who agrees that 30 plus 20% is 36? And who thinks that it's something different? And someone who thinks it's something different, say what you think it is. We've got 30.2 over here, also 30.2. Does anyone think it's something different than 30.2? Any guesses why Google doesn't return 30.2? It does 30 and then 20% of 30 and then adds them together. Um, and my speculation for that, actually, I want to hear your speculation for why it does that. Yeah. That's what most people are looking for when they type something like plus 20%, probably because they're trying to leave a tip, and probably they got some complaints from small businesses that people are leaving 20% tips, or sorry, 20 cent tips. Ah, oh, ruin that joke. What a disaster. Um, but here's the problem when you do 30 plus 20% is that this does not scale very well. And so I want you in this activity, or if you're not in the activity, just with your partner, I want you to guess what Google returns if you type 30 plus 20% plus 20%. And no cheating, no looking at the site. But let's collect some answers, talk with your partner, noisy room. I want to know what you think Google thinks that 30 plus 20% plus 20% is. Yeah, it's like 
Oh. All right, so I'm seeing a bunch of results up here. A lot of folks who think it's 43.2, a lot of folks who think it's 42, some folks who are maybe in the process of typing or else think that it's four. I'm so sorry, is that my audio? Can you still hear me okay? All right, technology that thinks with us and not for us is the topic today. Um, so here is my hint to the room is that nobody has yet gotten the right answer. There's not a single person who has done what Google does when you do 30 plus 20 percent plus 20 percent. I still don't see it. Oh, no, we've got two people who have what Google does. All right, but before I, before I reveal, someone want to make the case for 43.2? A 20% increase on top of a 20% increase. Someone want to make a case for 42? Adding it, adding it again. Both of these seem like very reasonable algorithmic choices. Um, anyone want to make a case for 37.2? I actually love this response, and I've never seen this one before. Who did this? <laughs> that is awesome. It's a 24% increase, so maybe it put the parentheses around the 20% of plus 20%, and then it applied that all. Um, so the thing that Google actually does here is 36.2. <laughs> Correct response. Um, and what is wild about this is I'm going to let you onto the next screen and show you some other results that it does. If you put parentheses around the 20% plus 20%, you don't get that brilliant 37.2. Instead, you get 30.4. But what if you put parentheses around the first two terms? Then you get our 43.2. And so in trying to implement a tip calculator, Google has managed to break associativity, <laughs> uh, commutativity, um, basically all of, all of math. Um, and so my big takeaway from this is that I'm not sure I yet trust Google to uh, drive my car for me. Um, that's, that's, my, that's my main takeaway. Um, and so a challenge for folks as I do a little bit of a rant, which is the next part of this presentation, if you would rather, is you can spend some time on Google and see if you can actually figure out what the spec was. Like some product manager somewhere said, here's how we need percent to behave, and try to describe it. Try to write an algorithm that gives these absolutely bananas results. So that is your project if you don't want to listen to me um, rant about technology in classrooms and outside of classrooms. Um, all right. So this is a video, I'm not actually sure this is gonna work, and I'm gonna skip over it anyway, but I recommend that you look this up. This is um, Eric Schmidt, I think, who's the CEO of Google, talking about his vision for Google um, in 2010. And he's describing, oh, please. What about 30 plus 20 percent That's a great question. See if you can figure it out and then write the algorithm to solve it. Um, yeah, Google does very different things when you multiply by percents than when you add percents, which is also pretty hilarious. Um, it's, a, it's a wild, wild algorithm. Um, but here's Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google, 10 years ago talking about his vision for the future of Google, which presumably is their vision for technology, where he says, let's say you're near a museum and you search for a hot dog. We can return the result for a hot dog that's right near where you are. 
And he says, we've got all this other information. We know where you've been before. We know where you're going. We know who your friends are. Maybe soon enough, you don't even need to ask us for a hot dog. We can just tell you, hey, I bet you're hungry and want a hot dog. There's a stand 15 feet away. And he says this as if it's the panacea. We should all be so excited. And I hear that, and I am terrified. Um, this is technology thinking for us instead of with us and working itself into corners as a result. And this is not just Google. Um, this is kind of the Bible of designers in Silicon Valley, a book called Don't Make Me Think, um, a common sense approach to web usability. And I contrast this with some of the progenitors of computational technology who had just the exact opposite idea. We want to be thinking as much as we possibly can, and we want computers to help us with that. So I think, for example, of Douglas Engelbart. Has anyone heard of, of this gentleman? Um, he is the inventor at uh, PARC, which was the Stanford lab, of the mouse, of the first constructive geometry technology, of networked software. And the vision that he laid out um, is this idea of a research center for augmenting human intellect. Computers are there to help us think new thoughts in new interesting ways, not to preempt not only the getting of the answer, but even the asking of the question which is where it seems like so much of technology is headed today. Um, Facebook on Instagram recently just switched so that instead of you choosing what it shows you, it shows you what it thinks you're gonna wanna see because that's more effective for TikTok. This is the direction so much technology is going and I hate it. Um, so my goal is the exact opposite. And so I wanna talk about what it feels like when technology thinks with you instead of for you. And the first premise that I have for this is that the thing that is at the center is then the person instead of the technology itself. And how can you tell when you're looking at a product if it is there to think with you versus for you? Um, and I think one easy way is to look at its advertising. How does it market itself? And is it like showing off how cool the tech is or is it showing off how cool the stuff is that you can do with the tech? And I wanna give you an example of each. So here's a product that maybe some of you have heard of and maybe my internet will be good enough to play, called Photomath. Has anyone heard of Photomath? Well, the audio is working, the video is not. Um, that's a bummer. All right, it's an ad, and you can imagine what this ad is showing. It's someone with their camera over a textbook, and it takes a picture, and magically it shows you the answer to that problem. And a lot of really interesting thought went into making that video, but all of it was by the programmers who built this software. None of it was by the people who use it. And I contrast this with something like Geometer's Sketchpad. Has anyone here used Geometer's Sketchpad? Absolutely brilliant software, and in a lot of ways feels like kind of the shoulders that um, Desmos has gotten to stand on. And if you look at any of their marketing materials over 40 years, it is always showing interesting examples of what someone did with the software. It's never like celebrating how brilliant the insight was of designing the software. It's celebrating the interesting ideas that come out of it. Um, and this to me is incredibly central to where I want technology to fit in society and also inside of classrooms. Um, and it comes back to something that one of the strands here has gotten to experience. And I'm uh, nervous to even show this slide, but I put it in every presentation, um, which is the Dimensions of Equity by Rochelle Gutierrez, who I have no idea if you're in the audience, but if you are, I am such a fan of your work and it has guided so much of what we do. And one of the premises here is that when folks talk about equity, and apologies so much if I'm getting this wrong, when folks talk about equity, they often talk about things like access and achievement, which is just saying inside of the system that currently exists, um, how are you fitting into that? And they don't talk about this other axis, the critical axis of identity and power. Do you have the tools to actually change the system? And so to me, technology that is doing your thinking for you is absolutely not equipping anyone with tools to change that technology itself. Um, and this shows up inside and outside of classrooms. So this is the first premise for me, and I promise the rant's over soon and we're gonna get to play with some math, assuming you can get on the internet, um, is that technology that thinks with you instead of for you is about the person and not about the product. Um, it lets you do interesting things. So let's look at some of these interesting things. Um, Technology that thinks with you instead of for you is transparent, and I've got the funniest video to play that you're not gonna get to see. But I'd encourage everyone in this room 
to do a Google search for, the, uh, for number wang. Has anyone ever seen this sketch? Um, so premise is it's a game show where it's just people shouting out random numbers and either they win or they don't win and there's just no insight into how it's happening but it's hilarious. And for so many people, this is what math is, is it's a game of number wing. Like, did I say the thing that you were looking for? I have no idea how. And for so much technology, it's the same. Did you type in stuff in exactly the right format and I'm gonna tell you I got it right or wrong? But technology that thinks with you is transparent to what it's doing. And we'll see some examples of this soon. Here's that, uh, just a teaser. Look at how funny this looks. It's gonna be so funny. Um, oh, this might work. Nope, it will not. Um, the other key part about technology that thinks with you and not for you is that it lets you build incrementally. It doesn't wait for you to get to the final product before you can see how well it's working. And one example of this that I love is actually something like Excel or a spreadsheet, where you can imagine a spreadsheet that it starts with just typing in the numbers, and then you're like, I wonder what would happen if this one depended on this one, and you incrementally can improve, and you can incrementally see what's happening, and also, anytime you open up someone else's spreadsheet, you know exactly what they did. It's all there. You can see every bit of it. And so what I want to do is switch over to the calculator. Um, and I want to show you a few examples of this in, uh, in action and let you play around with it as well. Um, all of this applies to other tech. I just happen to be more familiar with Desmos than I am with most uh, tools. And also, there aren't as many tools that fit this uh, design philosophy as I would like. So I'm going to pace us to play around with a couple different examples, and I'm going to show you up here on my screen. We're just going to get a blank calculator. Um, can folks see this OK? I'll make it a little bit bigger. And we're going to just play around and try to ask progressively more and more interesting questions. So here's one. I'm going to graph y equals x squared. I get a parabola. Everyone has seen this a 1,000 times, yeah? All right, I'm going to put it in standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c. Everyone has seen this a thousand times. I bet if I asked this room what happens if I changed a, folks would have a pretty good sense. Did this match your expectations? And if I adjust c, folks have a pretty good sense. Did that match your expectations? And if I adjust b, it's going to do something kind of weird. Did that match your expectations? For some people. Not for everyone. Does anyone want to try to formulate a um, hypothesis for what is going on when I change B? So you can either try to describe where the parabola is going, or you can try to come up with an explanation for why it is going in that way. And I want you to just type in this same thing into your calculator, play around with it for a few minutes with your partner, and see what you're able to discover just by incrementally building on top of this graph. I'm going to walk around while you do it.
All right, I want to show you two fun things I saw while I was walking around that you can build on top of. We're going to spend a little while on this one because there is so much depth to parabolas. There's so much depth. Um, so one fun thing I saw was someone completing the square. I think it was up there on the left, completing the square, and discovered that um, what you're going to look for here is, let's make A1 just so that we can make this um, as simple as possible to complete the square. Um, and we're going to find the x coordinate of the vertex is going to be at negative b over 2. Did I get that right? So I'm going to try graphing that and just check it. So I'm going to say that the x coordinate of the vertex is at negative b over 2. And let's confirm that it follows it. Sure enough. Um, you could try to expand this to make it so that it works even when we change a. So right now, these are going to become disconnected as I move this. I think it's maybe b over 2a. Does that sound right? Yeah. Nice. And so now as I change a, this is also going to follow. So that's one description of why it's moving right and left. And I think what I saw going on up there is trying to figure out where it's moving up and down. So that was a blast. Here's another thing I saw one group do, which is that you can, instead of having b be a single value, you can have it be a list of values. And we're going to play with this in a second to try to predict what's going to happen. So here, instead of b being negative 1.2, I'm going to use list notation. So I'm going to do brackets. And I'm going to have it be every value from negative 5 to 5. And I get this kind of picture. So you can also play around with that. And now you can explore many hypotheses at once. All right, so keep going. I just wanted to show those two techniques and see if there was any insights that came out of those. All right, a few things I saw walking around this time. So one, I heard a question about how does it decide what values to use in the list? And a hypothesis that it's just doing the integers, that is its default. But you can actually make it more dense. It will follow whatever linear sequence you start with. And so here, if I start at negative 5 and then do something like negative 4.5, it will now count by halves. If I do negative 4.9, it'll count by tenths. Um, so we can do anything that we want with those lists. Um, I saw a few folks who uh, seem to hypothesize that the path that the vertex follows is itself a parabola. Do folks agree with that? Anyone want to share what parabola they think it is? Hit it. Negative ax squared plus c. Nice. So we know it's going to be symmetric. So we probably think there won't be any b term. Um, and this looks quite plausible. I'm curious if someone is able to prove that this is the parabola it follows. But there's, oh, hit it. Oh, a little louder, please. Perfect. So we found the, the coordinate, the x coordinate was that negative b over 2a. You plug it in, and you end up with c minus b squared over 4a squared. Um, and so that tells you that it's going to follow this parabola. Is that right? Did I hear that right? Perfect. Um, so that is correct. There's a thing that I've always wondered, though. Like, that's descriptive of what's happening, but I don't have an intuitive sense for why. 
Algebra sometimes gives an intuitive sense. It doesn't always. I tried following, uh, doing the following thing when I first graphed this, and it opened up my eyes, and I didn't see anyone else do this. So maybe this is going to be a surprise for folks. What happens if I graph y equals just bx plus c? And now as I change b, what's staying the same? What changes? And what does that tell you about where the parabola should place itself? And what a fun connection between algebra and calculus, right? This is looking at the slope, the linearization at x equals 0. All right, so this was just one example where maybe folks who thought you knew a ton about parabolas maybe learned something. I don't know. I did. And maybe the software helped you, um, helped you think about parabolas more deeply. Did I see a hand up? OK, great. Um, let's try one more example of this before I set you free with some uh, tools and techniques that, that, might be, uh, that might be kind of fun to use. Um, so this was when we first introduced integrals. And we do integrals numerically, um, in part because writing a symbolic integrator is, as far as I know, impossible uh, to get perfect and really hard to get close. Um, and we found uh, a technique. It's actually not that old. It's maybe 10 or 12 years for doing numeric integration really quickly. Um, and one of my uh, beliefs is that technology that thinks with you, it has to be extremely responsive. It has to be so fast to try out a hypothesis that you want to try out many of them. So what I'm going to do here is try doing the integral from like, let's define a function first, sorry. f of x, I'm going to do my favorite one to show in a demo. And I'm going to do the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt. And it's going to now plot this antiderivative function. But what I wanted to do here was say, what would happen if instead of being the integral from 0 to x, it was the integral from 1 to x? Hypotheses. What's going to change if I change this 0 to a 1? It's going to shift. It's going to shift vertically, yeah? Um, let's try it. Sure enough, it shifts down a little bit. Did people expect that? OK, awesome. What happens if I change it to 2? It's going to shift again, but it's always keeping the same shape. This is a little bit why uh, we talk about the plus c when we're doing any derivatives. But I wanted to go a little bit deeper and try hooking this up to a slider. So we do a slider integral from a to x. And we're going to see that it's just kind of bopping around, popping up and down. So we've got an intuition um, built up over a lot of calculus for why it is that the shape stays the same, but it shifts up and down. Does anyone have an intuition for how it picks where it's going to be vertically? What's that? You can integrate from 0 to a to find out where it's going to be for what a is. That's one technique. I love it. Any other thoughts? In the back, yell. It will be 0 when x is a. Let's try that. And suddenly we get a picture. I'm going to put a comma 0. And watch this. It's just shifting the parabola to be at that point. And that's so natural when you think about it this way. But when I first saw that, I was like, of course. That's where it has to go. It has to position itself so that it's 0 here, because we know the integral from a to a is 0. Um, all right, so on the next screen, play around with integrals a little bit, if you would like. See if there's anything that you can learn from that. And then I'm going to go deep into lists and polygons and colors, and we're going to just mess around with math for a little bit if folks are OK with that. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, so put a comma after it? Yep, exactly. Perfect. Oh, heck yeah. 
<laughs> Pushing it to the limit. <laughs> Drag the like if I just drag the point, I guess it's possible like the effect to stay A but like changes A in consequence, but I guess the Y value I can just uh, That's actually your choice. So if you click and hold on the icon here. Oh sorry. Um yeah, click and hold on it. Yep. So oh. then you can choose which directions oh, it drags. Okay. All right, I'm going to pull this together. Are folks having fun playing with the calculator? Is that a good way to do this? All right, then I'm going to teach you some techniques that I imagine very few people in this room have uh, played with, I hope. Um, all right, so first, we're going to do this thing where everyone raise your hand if you have ever heard of Desmos. And then keep it raised if you have taught using Desmos. And keep it raised if you have uh, used sliders in Desmos before today. Um, and I guess, yeah, re-raise it if you've never taught but did use sliders. Um, and have used lists before today? And have used dynamic colors before today? And have used list comprehensions before today? All right, there's going to be something for everyone. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to open up, folks, so that you should feel free to just ignore me and play around instead of uh, following. And I'm going to show you what I've done for the next five screens. Actually, yeah, I'm just, you're unrestricted. Freedom. Go crazy. Um, so here, I've got a couple screens that are going to demo, and I'm going to also be doing this live, a couple of the features that we're going to look at. Um, so this one is about using colors, dynamic colors, and lists. Um, and then I've got one using uh, polygons and list comprehensions. Um, and then a playground screen that you should feel free to play with, or just go to Desmos. And then a few examples of graphs from actual students that combine all these features together. And so part of the transparency part of technology that I think helps folks think is that you can actually see everything that went into it. It looks like magic. I couldn't have made that graph from scratch, but everything that they did is there for the viewing. Um, so you can uh, learn from it and build on top of it and add your own thoughts. Um, but let's just uh, do a little bit of some features that maybe folks haven't seen as much. We're going to start with colors. Um, but first, a little backstory. So uh, we get a lot of emails every single day of people who are mad about various things. Um, the number one thing that people are mad about is the fact that um, math is really hard on computers. And floating point math sometimes gives you the wrong answer. 0.1 plus 0.2 is not exactly equal to 0.3 in base 10, um, if you've got a finite number of bits. The second most common annoyance is the answer we give for 0 to the 0. Um, does anyone have strong feelings about 0 to the 0? Nice. This is my kind of room. Someone want to share your very strong feelings about 0 to the 0? Undefined. We've got a strong feeling for undefined. Anyone else have a strong countervailing theory or feeling? What is it? Indeterminate form, also similar. I heard an argument for one. Would you like to make an impassioned case for one? Uh, OK, so one is the limit of x to the x as you're approaching. Let's hear an impassioned case. Oh, that's fun. In polynomials, the ones digit, they're always counting a zero to the zero. There isn't a hole at zero for every time that we graph a polynomial. I like that one. I like the binomial theorem claim. I like the thought about it's like you're multiplying it by itself this number of times, but you never even started. So like, what else could it possibly be? Um, but the third most common complaint that we used to get is that we didn't graph the color yellow. Um, people would say, I really need yellow in my graph. And we would say, build your own calculator. That was our, that was our stock response, um, if you really want yellow. We didn't do it in part for accessibility reasons. Um, but also, we didn't want 
uh, kids spending all of their time thinking about the colors. We wanted them thinking about math. And then we realized there was a way to have it so that kids would think about both, which is that they need to use math to make their colors. So here's how we did that. Um, I'm going to graph an equation. I can open this. I've got these six default colors. Every single one of them is um, compatible with the WCAG standards, except for orange, which is why we skip over it. And that was a compromised position with our uh, unruly users. Um, but if you wanted to find a color, we're going to need to uh, assign it to a variable. And there's two different color encoding schemes that you can use. One of them is RBG. I always forget if it's RBG or RGB, which one was the Supreme Court Justice uh, and Hero, and which one is a color scheme. Um, it is RBG. Nope, GB. <laughs> oh man, after all that. Um, and then each of these is a number between 0 and 255, because that is 2 to the 8th, and that's a nice compact way to encode something for a computer. Um, and so 0, 0, 0 says there's no red, no green, no blue. It comes out black. And 255, 255, 255 says that there's um, full saturation of all three of them, and it comes out white. Um, and you can also make them anything in the middle. So I'm actually going to do RGB like this. Um, and I can adjust them and watch this change color. I'm going to hook it up to this just so that it's a little bit more visible. So here's our color. I'm also going to make it really thick. So this is going to be 20 pixels wide so you can see it. And now we can watch what happens when I change the amount of red and the amount of green and the amount of blue. And you can make some interesting com uh, combinations. The other color scheme that could be interesting, we're going to make a different color. This is HSV. Anyone know what the H, the S, and the V stand for? I always forget. Hue, saturation, value. What do those three things mean? No idea. <laughs> Hands thrown up. Correct. Um, so I think that the hue is uh, the color, and it's uh, between 0 and 360, which has nothing to do with bits or bytes, but has to do with our arbitrary, how many degrees there are in a circle. And then S and V are both between 0 and 1. And one of them is something like how much black there is in the color, and the other one is something like how much white there is in the color. Um, but I, it's, it's a little bit confusing. But you can play with it and watch what happens. So I'm going to change this to that new color. And I'm going to go full saturation. And I'm also going to go full value. And then as I drag this, you'll see it goes around the color wheel. And for any one of these colors, I can make it fully white by getting rid of all of the saturation, and I can make it fully black by getting rid of all of the value. And it's a better color scheme for various things. But you can play around with these. But what I wanted to show you is that part of the dream of this tool is that all of the features stack on top of each other so that you can do that progressive building as you go. And so I'm going to combine this with lists. So what I'm going to do here is make this a little bit thinner Let's make this like five pixels wide. And I'm going to have this not just be sine of x, but sine of x plus, um, let's go like 0.5, 1, all the way up to 10, something like that. Um, actually, I did this way wrong. I'm going to make a list that is from 0 to 10. And I'm going to have it be the sine of that list divided by 2. So anytime you have a list, you can also divide it. It divides all the elements. You can exponentiate. It exponentiates every element. Here I've added um, like this. But I'm also going to want to make an array of colors. And the way I'm going to do that, let's make this a little bit thicker just so that it shows up a little bit better. Um, and instead of HSV all being um, 0 to 1 here. I'm going to have our saturation be the list as well, and it's going to be L divided by 10. And now suddenly each one of them also has its own color. And so we can see what happens if I change V against all of these, and maybe we'll get a little bit of a better sense of how those two things relate. Or I can try going around the color wheel and seeing what stays the same and what's different. So spend a few minutes, if you would like, just playing around with colors combined with lists, try to make something fun, and feel free to take inspiration. Oh, please. Is there an easy way to, uh, 
easy no, but possible yes. Um, so there's a set of list elements that we can do. Um, let me try to do this on the fly. They say you should never do that. Forgive me if this goes badly. Um, is there a way to manipulate the list so that the last element becomes the first element? And so what I'm going to do is make a list here. L is the values 1 through 10. Um, and just so that we can see what's happening, I'm going to plot L against L, like this. And I'm going to make a new list that uh, shifts that list by 1. So I'm, do you want the element from the end to come to the beginning or the element from the beginning to go to the end? Either way. All right. So we can use a syntax here that says take the second element to the last element, and then I'm going to join the first element. Um, so we can do this. And now if I plot L, L2, we're going to see that it's a shifted version of the list. So you can get subsections of a list, and then you can also join two lists together. Um, so that combo should give you what you want. But yeah, play around with lists, play around with colors for just a couple minutes, and feel free to take inspiration from any of the graphs that are on future screens where students are using this combination of dynamic colors and lists to make things that look like they're rotating in three dimensions um, or solve that problem that we spent a while working on yesterday of the Apollonian uh, circle packing. And I'm going to pull us back together in seven minutes. So you got to click and hold on that icon, click and, hold. and then um, it's now a new color that's available to you. Uh, this one. It's that bottom one. So uh, if you click on that, now it's going to be that one. I'm going to demo that, actually. Good call. Um, for folks who haven't found how to change color, that is not your fault. That is my fault. And the answer is that the icon next to every expression, if you click and hold on it, it gives you options. And one of them is that list of colors. So you need to click and long hold on the icon next to an expression, and that'll let you change the color. Mm -hmm. Can you do the same thing with the RGB version? Absolutely. So same idea, where for R, you would make R a list. Oh, so R would be And so R try something like zero. Can I do the same? So R is thinking it's like the radius. So yeah. Can can you can. a different color? No, if you just turn it off, then that'll oh. be fine. Okay. Um, and try doing that times 36. Um, no, that's not. Wait. Um, so times is going to be shift eight. Perfect. And now you'll get a big range. Yeah. Yeah, you can do it to R, N, G, M, B. Um, and actually, I chose the wrong. It should have been times 250. Or sorry, times 25. Because the number should go from 0 to 250. You can't do that yet, because that would require us to be uh, programming on the GPU, which is coming, but not yet. Um, but you can sort of by making a list of values and then using that. Exactly. Exactly. So I'll actually demo how to do that in one second. Good call. Yeah. And like I wanted us to create a few circuits first and then have a way of having them roll around. Yep. Yeah, that's gonna take some work. Well I would just put like another slider in front of Yeah, so I think um 
you'd want to figure out how to write all of those in terms of a different parameter. Yeah. And then you can drag it. Take it for a minute. It's not even irritating at all. So my R changed to the radius. Oh and yeah. I can't un like I delete it. If you it, I click it that, if you click on the display, then it just like won't show it, and right. that'll be fine. Oh okay. So it can still use it. That's like, there's a few special variables. Oh, it is changing the color. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I knew that. I knew that R was a special variable. So it. Actually but it also can be referenced. Yeah, right. it means both. Oh okay. So it's. So it's it like both plotting and referencing. It's a very weird one. That is cool. Thank you. A uh, cool or <laughs> annoying but quirk of mathematic yeah. notation, one or the other. Nice. Yeah, so for, I would do, I did, yeah, and so you could re-reference it, yeah, just change S equals um, from that to that like 1 dot 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 10 divided by 10, because we want it to be a value between 1 and 10, and then it will map to each one. All right, I'm going to pull this together with apologies. Because I want to show one more feature, which was a question from over here. And then I'd love to go on to the next section. And I think I've got 12 minutes left. Is that right? All right. We are, I think, going to successfully fit three hours into one hour, um, partly by going extremely shallow. So a question was, how do you have the color depend on the position of a point or a value? Um, and it turns out that that is not possible inside of our system yet but that's never stopped the students who use it from figuring out a way to do it anyway. And we added a feature that I think you're going to find uh, useful, I hope, which is that lists are very one-dimensional. And you can still do very interesting things with them, right? Like I could make a list here of the values 1 through 10 or negative 10 to 10. And I could graph something like L and L squared. Um, and this is great. I managed to plot a bunch of points, but it's still fairly one-dimensional. And a thing we might often want to do is, for example, make a grid of points and play around with that grid of points. So we added a feature. We imported it from um, Python and some other computer languages, um, which is called list comprehensions, where you can make a list out of other lists. So the other thing you might have noticed is that when you like add a list with a list, you end up with a list that's the same length. It doesn't give you the cross product that's the size of the whole matrix because that would have been absolutely bananas for a lot of things we tried. But you might want to do that anyway. And so here's how we can do that. We do our brackets. And I'm going to do something like x, y, 4. x is 1 to 10. And y is 1 to 10. And then uh, when I zoom back to a reasonable viewport, I'm going to get a whole grid of points. Um, and so now what you could do is define colors based on, for example, the x and y values. Should I try this on the fly? This might be a disaster. All right, I'm going to try it. Um, I'm going to make this 0 0.1 up to 1 in that direction, and I'm going to make this 0 0.1 up to 1 in this direction. I'm going to zoom way in um, like this. Let's make these points all a lot bigger just so that they show up nice on our screen. So instead of being 9, I'm going to make them uh, 20, 30, something like this. Oh, man, I've never tried this. All right, I think, I think we're going to be able to do it. Um, I'm going to make this a thing that we can reference. And I'm going to make a set of colors, which I'm going to say that my colors are, let's do HSV. I'm going to want this one to be a slider that can go from 0 to um, 360, so I've got my same classic colors. Let's hook it up to here. So now as I change H, this is going to change. And I'm going to make it so that the X coordinate gives us the saturation and the Y coordinate gives us the value. And so I'm going to do, I don't know if this is going to work, L dot X, L dot Y, and we managed to make a grid. So this is the way that you can have the color depend on both of the coordinates if you want to. 
So the idea of all of this is that you could open up this graph, you could see it, you could build on it, and you could maybe make something uh, like some of what we've seen in the rest of this activity. Um, so I'm going to actually leave this behind here. And feel free to play with it all you want later. Feel free to accost me. I think I've got Q&A right after this. Anything that you run into that you're curious how it works, or especially any complaints. What I wanted to do is go on to the last piece for me of technology that thinks with you. And this one is a little bit of a stretch to fit into this talk, but I wanted to do it anyway, which is the importance of technology being accessible. Um, and for me, this means many, many different things. Um, you should be able to show up and use it the first time, even if you're not a confident math learner. That's really important to me. But the specific I wanted to talk about here is accessible from the perspective of students with learning differences and students with various uh, disabilities, physical or mental disabilities. And the one that we think about a lot is students who are blind and students who are visually impaired. Um, and part of the reason for this comes back to a story uh, I heard from our lead accessibility engineer who is himself blind. Um, and he was describing what it used to be like if you were a blind student trying to learn algebra. And the answer was that you just basically ran into a wall. Like the, the pinnacle of technology for a blind student would be a piece of braille graph paper. So picture this, you've got graph paper and it would have um, like raised axes and raised viewports and then a piece of clay with a little wire in it that you would use to form the graph that you wanted to show. So someone would say graph y equals x squared and you would try to approximate it using clay, but there wasn't any dynamic technology to do it. So there was no way to check it, there was no way to get feedback, there was no way to try that thing where you move a slider and you notice how it changes. Um, and so he said his mission was to try to make it so that uh, vision impaired and blind students could also have dynamic interactions with the math. Um, and to me, this was such an eye opener of technology can actually help you think deeper thoughts. It can help you explore broader domains. It often doesn't, it often does the opposite, but it can, and for some populations, the technology just wasn't there to help explore those domains. Um, so I just wanna show you a little bit about what Steve built, because I'm just insanely proud of it. Um, there are a few different features uh, around, for example, talking to you as you're typing. So you type out an, uh, an equation or an expression and it will evaluate it. But my favorite one is um, audio trace, where you can graph a line like this, go into here, click the play button, and it will play it as sound. And this is, uh, we'll see if this works. Let me know if you can hear it. Did that come across? And I can change this. I can make it something like 10 sine of x. And we can see how that's gonna change the shape or sound of this curve. The audio is way better on your own computer, I promise. Um, <laughs> there are a few just like very fun details that Steve built into this, like it's um, stereoscopic. And so if you're wearing headphones, it starts sounding like it's coming out of your left ear and ends sounding like it's coming out of your right ear. Um, and when there's intersections between graphs, he recorded himself making a little like pop sound with his cheek, you know that thing? And so it pops when it hits some of these. Um, but one of the reasons that I'm so obsessed with accessibility is that it turns out that when you build in accommodations, it ends up helping everybody. Um, and my favorite metaphor for this, not metaphor, example, um, was all of the laws around what's called curb cutting, which is the idea that um, if a sidewalk is this elevated, a wheelchair isn't gonna be able to get up over it. And so anytime that you have public access, you need to make sure that there's a cut in the curb. Um, and this was, I think, uh, pushed really hard by um, advocacy groups for folks uh, with limited mobility. But it turns out that anytime you're dragging a roller bag, you're probably grateful for this. And anytime that you're looking down at your phone and walking and don't trip and fall on your face, you're probably grateful for this. Um, and this audio trace is an example of that, where we've seen uh, classrooms do just such interesting things with audio trace and it opens up some new understandings. And I want to just show you one very straightforward uh, example of this and then some not so straightforward examples, um, which is it's kind of counterintuitive and definitely a convention that we plot things from left to right and that slope being positive looks like this. 
Um, and I bet that when you were learning this, and I bet that when folks who are teaching were teaching this, and when folks who are teaching teachers who are going to teach this, you're going to run into this. Um, and it's not that obvious that the slope of this is one, that it's increasing, that it's going up, that it should go from left to right. Um, but as soon as you play this as sound, you notice something about it. Right? And if I were to switch that, if I make it negative, it's going to sound really different and it's going to go down. And so one of the things that I've heard is that when folks are teaching slope, turning on audio trace is this light bulb moment for some of the students in their class. Um, the other fun thing about it is that students now get really into um, trying to make it do their bidding. And so instead of just, I want to know the shape of this curve, they say, for example, I want to make a graph that plays the Moonlight Sonata. And then they do. Or they say that they want to do, oh man, let me find it, this one. Um, anyone want to guess what song this is? Oh, it's going to come out so bad on the audio. Oh man, this is going to be a bummer, but let's try it anyway. Someone managed to write a full Rickroll as one equation. Look at that. <laughs> That's a singular equation and one of the best uses of, what's that function? I think it's a logistic curve. Does that look right? I don't know. One of the best uses of that I've ever seen. Um, so encourage folks to feel free to play around with this feature also um, and see what it reveals for you. But I think that is, oh, I timed this perfectly, wow. Um, I think that's, uh, that's everything that I wanted to share today. Um, my takeaway is that I'm hoping for you, and then there's a closing screen where feel free to add reflections, um, feel free to enjoy the Calvin and Hobbes comic on that last screen. Um, but this is my first draft of what I think it requires for technology to think with you instead of for you. And the things you can look for are that it centers the human instead of the product. You can look at what is the marketing? Is it all about how cool the tech is or is it all about how cool the stuff you can do with the tech is? Um, it's really transparent. That's the way that you can think thoughts that you can see. And for me, the like pinnacle of transparency is pencil and paper, which I maintain is one of the best pieces of technology humanity has ever come up with. Um, it lets you build incrementally. It lets you try a thing and then build on top of it and then build on top of that and build on top of that. That's the only way to have really, really profound deep thoughts, or uh, maybe the best way. Um, and it's something that we do in math all the time. It's something that we've been doing for three weeks in our morning math. Um, and finally, is accessible, uh, because this is our way of making sure that technology thinks with all of us, not just with some of us. And every time that we build new accessibility tools, it ends up benefiting every single person. Um, so that's me. Thank you for having me here. Um, I've heard such wonderful things about this conference. Did not disappoint. And I think over to whoever is in charge. Thanks very much, Eli. So that was wonderful.